Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for waiting around to, uh, to join us for this, uh, this end of the day panel. Um, realize there's a lot of competition out there, a lot of excellent topics, a lot of great speakers. And uh, so we're grateful that, that uh, you have joined us for this conversation on Cuba. My name is Jose Cardenas. I'm a board member of the ACU. And I will be moderating uh, this discussion or this conversation. Um, obviously, if uh, you didn't sleep uh, through the, the past year, uh, you know that uh, a little over a year ago, President Obama sparked uh, a bit of controversy when he announced his intention to normalize relations with Cuba. Uh, and in fact, uh, the controversy was actually rekindled uh, a few weeks ago when uh, President Obama announced that he would be traveling to Cuba uh, this month, in fact, and which would be the uh, first president to set foot in Cuba since Calvin Coolidge in 1928. Our purpose here for this conversation is to take a hard look at President Obama's decision to open up to Cuba. Is it in the U.S. interest? And secondly, where, where is Cuba going? Raul Castro, Fidel Castro's uh, younger brother and successor, says he is going to retire in 2018. But what, what does that mean? And what role, what should be the role of the United States in, uh, uh, in, in the, the coming months and, uh, and years? Now, if you would allow me, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what this debate will not be about. We have two serious speakers who have no illusions about the true nature of the Castro regime. We are not here to debate whether Fidel Castro was a benevolent dictator who brought health and education to his benighted peoples. Uh, that's a debate for the, the faculty lounge at, at your local university. Our starting point is that the Castro brothers are ruthless dictators who brook no dissent and regularly repress their opponents. The question is, how should the United States respond? Should we seek to overwhelm the regime's control with U.S. trade and tourism? Or are U.S. interests better served by continuing to deny resources to the Castro's repressive rule by tightening trade and travel restrictions? As I said, we have two standout speakers who are among the best at discussing these issues. I have asked each to offer about eight to ten minutes of opening remarks in order to leave enough room for your questions. Now to begin to address the question of whether opening up Cuba to U.S. trade and tourism serves U.S. interests, I, I would like to begin by introducing Juan Carlos Hidalgo, who is a policy analyst on Latin America at the Cato in Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. Previously, he was a Latin America director of the International Policy Network. He writes frequently on Latin American affairs, and his articles have been published in a variety of media outlets. He's also a weekly col columnist in La Nación, which is Costa Rica's most influential daily newspaper, and he appears regularly on CNN in Espanol and numerous other networks. So to begin, I'll turn it over to Juan Carlos. Thank you, Jose, and thank you for pointing out that um, both of, of the positions that you're going to hear today have no, uh, we're not under pretenses about the good nature of the Castro brother regime. I mean, we both, uh, we're, we're uh, highly critical of the Cuban dictatorship, and we don't believe that, uh, that we're doing this for the sake of, of, you know, like hoping that all of a sudden the Castro brothers are gonna discover their inner Montesquieu and, you know, believe in democracy and, and the wonders of separation of powers and so on. I'm gonna tell you why I think President Obama is right in engaging Cuba, in opening up Cuba. Uh, but I, I also want to make clear that I think that the trip to Cuba is a big mistake. I don't think that he's, I don't think that the, the Cuban people will benefit 
from having President Obama visiting and, and hugging Raul Castro. I, unless President Obama follows the steps of Jimmy Carter when he first went to Cuba in 2002 and, and he uh, met dissidents, he uh, addressed the nation uh, on TV uh, in Spanish, uh, calling for democracy, calling for the respect of human rights, calling, calling for greater freedoms. Uh, I think that President Obama should do that. I don't think he will do that, though. I think he's doing this more for his ego, uh, more for his legacy. You know, he wants to be the, the equivalent of Nixon who went to China, the president who went to Cuba. And I think that in that regard, even people, I'm encouraged by the fact that even people who support his policy toward Cuba have been critical of, of this trip, of the idea of this trip. And even President Obama in December, he said that uh, he wouldn't travel to Cuba unless the Cuban government will show more openness and unless the Cuban government uh, will take bolder steps toward uh, political freedoms, toward liberalization of, of, of the political system. We haven't seen that. Actually, we have seen just the opposite. We have seen an increase in arbitrary arrest, and arbitrary arrest in January were at a record high uh, in Cuba. We have seen even some reversals on economic reforms. Uh, the number of uh, independent workers in Cuba has uh, decreased uh, somewhat uh, since President Obama um, engaged Cuba. So I understand that opponents of his policy can point at these facts and say, like, look, this is not working. Uh, but I'm going to tell you why I think the United States should engage um, Cubans. I think that it is very important to expose Cubans and Americans to the social realities of each other. Uh, when I went to Cuba in 2007 to meet dissidents in the island, I was impressed about how fond Cubans are about American culture, how fond they are about everything that is US. They're craving to be exposed to US music, tourists, everything that sounds like America, they really want to have a uh, um, a, closer, a closer relationship with that. And by preventing Americans from traveling to Cuba, and pre by preventing Americans from trading with Cuba and communicating with Cuba, I think that actually the U.S. government was helping the Castro regime, uh, you know, by isolating ordinary Cubans from the wonders of American culture, the wonders of American capitalism, and so on. Also, it is true that when Americans travel to Cuba, some of the money, or perhaps even most of the money, ends up in the coffers of the Cuban regime. Uh, we know how, for example, hotel uh, businesses over there conduct themselves by hiring Cubans, but when, they come to, when it comes to paying their wages, they actually pay the Cuban government their wages. And it's the Cuban government that then pays the wages of these, of these workers with the value, to, with uh, worthless uh, Cuban pesos. So it's kind of like a slavery regime. But still, by having hundreds of thousands of Americans now visiting Cuba, you're going to have a trickle-down effect of many, a lot of money going into the pockets of independent um, and the, the independent economy, or the, or the, or the nascent economy. It's estimated that 20% of Cuba's uh, workforce now works in this small private sector. Uh, restaurants, hotel and breakfast, uh, bed and breakfasts, and so on. So these people are benefiting from having access to dollars, from having access to uh, money from tourists. And there is nothing that can uh, help, uh, there's nothing more uh, subversive than having a population that doesn't depend exclusively on government for their, life, for their livelihood. By having a significant, a significant proportion of the Cuban economy earning their own wages by engaging in economic activities with American tourists, I think that you are instilling in the long run, an independent factor within this sector of the population that 
is going to make them less dependent on government, and eventually that could lead to greater uh, assertiveness in the future. I'm not going to say this is going to happen overnight, and this is something that we have to be clear when we talk about uh, how engaging and trading with Cuba and having American tourists go into the island are, is going to eventually change the nature of the political system in Cuba. We cannot fool ourselves to say that this is going to happen overnight, that this is going to happen in five years, that this is going to happen uh, anytime soon. But it's a step forward. Now, I think also that I, my, 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 my take also on, uh, on the embargo and the travel ban is also philosophical. You cannot pretend to foster freedom abroad by curtailing the freedom of Americans. I think that's one of the uh, uh, big contradictions of the previous policy toward the island. We're, the US government is doing the, this in the name of freedom. And by doing this in the name of freedom, is preventing, is curtailing the freedom of Americans to travel where they want to travel, to travel where they choose, Cuba, or to trade with people from a specific country like Cuba. And we have to, um, we have to acknowledge the uh, absurdity of the fact that only this policy applies only to Cuba. The United States trades with uh, every single country in the world except with, uh, with the island. Well, now it, it is increasingly trading, and agricultural trade is, 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 uh, has been important in the last 10 years. But these kind of sanctions, namely the embargo and the travel ban, apply only to Cuba. Cuba even Americans are free to travel to Iran, are free to travel to North Korea, but not to Cuba, which I think is, is absurd. Uh, another point in favor of, in, of this policy, of President Obama's policy, is that everybody is favoring it. A majority of Americans is favoring it. A majority of Cuban Americans are favoring it. And a majority of Cubans in the island are favoring uh, engaging with the United States. So by opposing this, uh, this uh, rapprochement, we're serving just the interests of a minority of people who actually believe that 50 years on, a policy that has utterly failed in bringing about change to Cuba is somehow do in the next few years what it hasn't done in half a century. Finally, at some point, even the government's agencies particularly the Government Accountability Office, pointed out that the embargo was a security liability itself because it drained resources from the Custom and Protection Border uh, offices, of, uh, offices towards enforcing the embargo, you know, preventing people from bringing cigars to, uh, to the United States and preventing people from bringing goods uh, and, and trying to stop people who actually went to the island. And that those resources were drained from properly being uh, uh, spent on preventing terrorists from coming to the United States or preventing people from bringing in uh, drugs and so on. So I think that uh, these are different, different reasons why I, I, I support President Obama. I think if I have to pick one, I will stick with the philosophical one, uh, namely that you cannot pretend to uh, foster or you know, trying to bring about freedom in other countries by curtailing the freedom of Americans themselves to trade and to travel to whatever they want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Uh, just, uh, just one bit of, of clarification. Um, both our speakers are, are, are very well informed uh, about Cuba policy. Um, Juan Carlos spoke about the, the, the ban on travel. Uh, what Obama did uh, in part of his executive decisions was he opened up why Americans are traveling there today 
is that he opened up some categories whereby uh, people are, can, can legally travel to Cuba if they are there uh, for a, an express purpose. For example, a, a cultural visit, something that fosters, in, 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 according to the Obama administration, something that fosters people to people at exchange. Just flat out tourist travel uh, is still uh, barred by, by US law. So that, that's the distinction there. Our second speaker is Mauricio Claver Carone. He's executive director of Cuba Democracy Advocates here in Washington. It's a nonpartisan organization dedicated to the promotion of human rights, democracy, and rule of law in Cuba. In an independent capacity, Mauricio is co-founder and director of the U.S. Cuba Democracy PAC. It's the largest single foreign policy pol uh, political committee in the United States and the largest Hispanic political committee in history. He's also host of the foreign policy show from Washington al Mundo on Sirius XM's channel 153. And his articles have appeared in numerous publications and is a frequent witness testifying on Capitol Hill. So for a different perspective, we'll turn it over to Mauricio. Hi. Thank you so much. I'm, the, I'm going to be the anti-philosophical view. Uh, I greatly respect Juan Carlos, and I greatly respect the philosophical view. Uh, but as Benjamin Franklin said, there's nothing uh, more tragic than seeing a beautiful theory be destroyed by a gang of brutal facts. And unfortunately, the facts don't support the theory that Obama's policy was based on. First and foremost, let's begin that Obama's policy change was not based on, essentially, a philosophical view that more Americans were going to bring freedom, et cetera. Obama's policy change and the secret negotiations that took place over 18 months with the Castro regime in Toronto Ottawa and Rome uh, began as a result of a hostage taking. So the question that Jose par uh, first put before us, whether it was in the U.S. interest, the change of policy that Obama did, the first answer to that is that it began and it stemmed from the taking of an American as a hostage. No policy that stems from a hostage taking is in America's interest. In itself, it's, anti it's antithetical to America's interests. This all began in December 7th of, two of 2009 when Alan Gross, an American development worker, was taken hostage by the Castro regime. The reason why he was taken ca hostage uh, was because well, first and foremost, the excuse the regime gave was that he was essentially helping the Cuban people with internet connectivity. Now, internet connectivity is an international uh, right uh, recognized under the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the connectivity amongst people. Uh, he was simply helping some people connect to the internet freely. But he was really taken hostage, as admitted to by the Castro regime itself, because they wanted an exchange of prisoners. There was five Cuban spies that were here in prison in the United States, including one serving two life sentences for the murder of four Americans. Those individuals who were shot down in 1996 um, um, by two Cuban MiG planes, uh, and essentially uh, their families have now been denied justice because the Castro regime got its way. Essentially, through a process of secret negotiations, the, President Obama commuted the life, the life sentence of this murderer uh, and three other Cuban spies in exchange for this hostage that was being held uh, for simply engaging in what is a fundamental uh, human right for all. That's where this policy stems from. That's where we go on in regards to it. Now, what has happened since December 17, 2014, when the president's new policy has, has come about? Well, as you can imagine, as any policy that stems from a hostage taking, or in other words, coercion, things have gotten from bad to worse. As Juan Carlos correctly stated, Political arrests in Cuba have skyrocketed. Last month was the second most repressive month in decades in Cuba in regards to political arrests. November 2015 was the most repressive in decades in regards to political arrests. Last year, we saw nearly 9,000 political arrests. Religious persecution, uh, the number of churches, the, the cases of violations of religious freedom have increased tenfold. Uh, dramatically, 200 churches, non-Catholic churches in particular, have been uh, uh, demolished by the Castro regime. We've seen emigration, the number of Cubans fleeing the island. They haven't gotten Obama's message of hope and change. The number of Cubans fleeing, risking their lives, whether overseas or through smugglers uh, trying to get out through Ecuador, which I won't get into details why they're trying to do that. It's kind of more complex and we'll waste time on it. Uh, but going through these dangerous routes to try to cross the border has doubled, has doubled since then. They, they're not getting the message of hope and change. Meanwhile, when you get coercion, 
you get coercion back. U.S. agricultural sales, which have been allowed since the year 2000 on a cash basis, have dived. The Cubans now are buying less because there's, of course, only one purchaser, the Castro regime. And now they're saying, hey, you know what? I want even more. So keep giving me more in that regards. Self-employment, which is this category, which is really a perverted category because it's not, you know, these, these independent entrepreneurs, as the media likes to hype, don't have articles in corporation. They don't own their businesses. They can't sell their businesses. They have essentially nothing. They have a license. They're licensees of the state to perform one of 200 uh, um, um, essentially menial tasks. The biggest one is essentially being able to run a small restaurant. But it's not, they have no essentially property rights, they have no contractual rights, they have no recourse in that regards. So that has gone down. Meanwhile, the monopolies of the Castro regime have increased and, and they're consolidating more and more uh, uh, the, their, their different monopolies um, and, and in order to take advantage. Of, of, the, of these openings by Obama. But I think it's a really interesting point, and I want to just kind of, uh, because of the most compelling argument that Juan Carlos makes is this whole notion of, wow, you know, we should be contagion Cubans with our freedoms. And I always answer that in two ways. First and foremost, there are Cubans that have spent 20 to 30 years in prison because of American democratic ideals. No spring breaker is gonna to go to Cuba and, let, and give anybody Cuban who's fighting for freedom, who's being tortured, who's being beaten, who's being imprisoned, is going to teach them what American democratic ideals are about. Sometimes we take our ideals for granted and we take our freedoms for granted. We can learn a lot uh, from, from that, not the other way around, and, and at a huge cost, by the way, of what it entails. But I'm always fascinated, and the proof is in the pudding, when they say everybody that goes to Cuba, they say they love Americans. They love Americans. I went to Cuba and they loved Americans. Why do they love Americans so much? I mean, you have a regime that's telling them that every cause of their ills is due to Americans, that the embargo has caused them all the harms, that we're the evildoers, that we're the worst people in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And yet they love Americans. You have a million and a half Canadians that go to Cuba every year, and you never hear them, oh, I love Canadians. I want to be just like the Canadians. You have the French that go to hang out with the little girls and see prostitutes and things of the sort. No one says, I want to be like the French, or I want to be like the Spaniards, or I want to be like the Mexicans. They want to be like the Americans. Why? Because we stand for something. Because they know that we have been the only ones on their side. And they have a knee-jerk reaction. Hey, guys, it's not a coincidence that the only two countries in the world that have statues of George W. Bush are Albania and the Republic of Georgia. Because they know, that it's, it, they have this, this, these are Eastern Europeans, people that knew that during the Cold War, we stood by their side. And what we're doing now, the policy that Obama is putting now, is essentially one of saying, we're going to lead from behind. The excuse that the administration gives is, you know, Latin America wants this. It's going to help us, you know, bring our neighbors and, and, do, and, and essentially follow their lead, and it's going to improve our inter-American relations. By doing what they've been doing for decades by doing business with Castro's monopolies, by hanging out and doing tourism to Cuba, and things of the sort. And meanwhile, us who stood for something, who stand for fundamental principles, are now going to lower our standards to follow the lead of Mexico and Central and South American countries in essentially rolling out the red carpet for the Castro regime. That's not leadership. That's not leadership. All of these countries signed uh, uh, an inter-American democratic charter on September 11, 2001. And it said essentially that representative democracy was to be the hallmark of our relations with America. But all of these, all of these nations that do so, you know, they, when ex-presidents are very brave when they leave office in Latin America, but when they're actually in office, they don't stand for these principles. Because they have domestic, of course, the Castro regime is very good at sparking you know, uh, uh, grief and concern in all of these countries. So now we're going to be blackmailed into following this poor lead. I frankly uh, disagree with that. Um, look, two things, essentially. The, the other thing the administration will tell you is that what they want to do is they're going to let's move our focus from you know, the freedom, democracy movement, from dissidents, and let's focus on helping, you know, let's go the, the economic route. By doing business with Castro's monopolies, we're essentially going to help this self-employment sector that I mentioned. The proof is that forever, dictatorships have been brought down by two things, democracy movements and black markets. 
The reason why, the reason why today this whole self-employment perverted sector, this perversion which is a self-employed license, a licensee that can say, hey, you can perform this menial task, but you don't have an article of incorporation, you don't own anything, or you don't do anything, and we can take whatever we want with no recourse at any time we want. The reason they did that was to try to suck in the sprawling black market in Cuba, to try to control it. It's a disservice. It doesn't help in that regards. But most importantly, you know, you have this whole concept of, well, because somehow, you know, American travelers are going to, you know, they're going to have this trickle-down effect on, 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 uh, on doing business with Cuba. Well, what does that trickle-down effect entail? By the way, if every American traveler to Cuba would stay at a Casa Particular, which are these licensed homes that you can stay there uh, and eat at these private restaurants, that'd be fine. But that's less than 5% of people that travel to Cuba. All American travelers that have been going to Cuba, the overwhelming majority are staying at hotels owned by the Cuban Military and Intelligence Services. They're, they're, they, they go to the, these, these state restaurants, these, they, 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 do the, they go to Tropicana, they go to Abuela Ita Medio, they go to all these famous places which are all, all, all owned and operated by the Cuba state. I, I always like to say this, it's, it's, it's interesting, I think Congress has tested this. We talk about the embargo and people say, oh, we're, about, we're against the embargo and things of the sort. And I say, let's not talk about the embargo. Do you support transacting business with entities owned and operated by Cuba's military and state security services and their subsidiaries? No. Who the hell would? Well, guess what? Article 18 of the Cuban Constitution says all foreign trade and investment in Cuba must be through them. So then what are we advocating for? Do we think that they're going to have a trickle-down effect? And I'm going to shut up now because I'm being told to shut up. Do we think that they're going to have a trickle-down effect? I'm going, to show, I'm going to tell you why it's not a case. And it's a beautiful theory, but it doesn't work. In 2000, we were told that if we sold agricultural and medical products to Cuba, that this was going to start, you know, uh, you know uh, they're going to learn how to do business, and then they're, somehow they're going to, the inter-Montesquieu is going to come in in that regard. Well, guess what's happened since then? Since 2000, we've sold about $5 billion worth of agricultural goods to Cuba. Over 250 American entities have done so. How many Cuban ent entities have transacted business with all of those? One, a company called Alamport owned by the Castro brothers. So where's the trickle down? 16 years later, name one foreign company anywhere around the world that has conducted business as trade investment with an independent Cuban, an individual. It doesn't exist. They've all been done with these entities owned and operated by Cuban military and intelligence services. I believe in trickle-down economics in free societies. Problem is, in totalitarian regimes, it doesn't translate uh, per se. So I'm going to shut up before. I yeah. Juan Carlos, if you have some rebuttals, if you could work them into your, uh, into your answers, because we're going to go right to okay. questions. All right. But uh, I want you two to, to, uh, to stand here, and then we'll go to uh, questions. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the Pope. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it was just show. You know, like uh, nowadays every single politician has to mention the Pope in one of his speeches. And I think it was just a, a way to sell the agreement, you know, to mention that the Pope was, was behind it. But I don't think he played much of a role. I, I, that's what I think and that's what, I, what I've heard. But I, maybe I'm wrong. But I, I, I don't think that he had much to do with this. I don't know if... <laughs> um, so look, the evangelical movement in Cuba is growing pro uh, very fast, unfortunately. And I think part of the reason for that is because the Catholic Church in Cuba, unfortunately, has chosen to cut deals with the regime for their mutual survival. This isn't unique to Cuba. We saw it in Central America during the military dictatorships there in the 70s and 80s. It moved people because of the close relationship between the Catholic Church and those dictatorships. It moved people away from the Catholic Church into the evangelical uh, uh, movements. That's what we're seeing in Cuba. It's not a coincidence that this year alone, in 2015, there were 200 evangelical churches demolished, forcefully demolished by the Castro regime. Meanwhile, the cardinal you know, goes and has his... Uh, uh, what, what's, what's one of those cute drinks that you have at night, whatever, well, I don't know, goes have his, co his cognacs with Raul Castro. There's a mutual survival strategy there between the Catholic Church, they use each other. They're doing it right now for Obama's trips. They're telling dissidents and, and, and famous political prisoners, hey, you can leave Cuba one time, 
And who's going to, the, to, to these political prisons and trying to convince them to leave the country and then actually stay out of the country, not to create problems? It's the Catholic Church. But what happens when you become their voice person? You lose followers, and I think that's what we're seeing. Yes, sir. My question is, uh, with, with these uh, situations with, with Cuba, with the uh, repression, with the prisoners, with the refusal to return the uh, American fugitives, why not put pressure on these companies and embarrass them, just like they did in the apartheid, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa? Why, why not put pressure on these companies to embarrass them? Because they deal with, they're dealing with a bloody dictator who's uh, got, got his uh, foot on the neck of the people. It's obvious. Well, the, the, actually, I think, I'm from Miami. I actually think the exile community is much too circumspect in that regard. They, they should be more aggressive, just like the anti-apartheid movement was in the 1980s. Well, I think that the, the, the problem with that is that the Castro regime has been tremendously skillful at selling itself abroad, you know? It's not, but for, for, for many people uh, in Latin America, and this is one of the things, and that's part of my rebuttal now, <laughs> I'm gonna use it. The problem with the, with, with the previous policy of, of trying to isolate Cuba by, by, with the embargo, with the travel ban, and so on, is that it, gave a perfect opportunity to the regime to present itself as a victim of US aggression abroad. So you go to every single Latin American summit, and the number one topic is the so-called blockade, because they, they present it as a blockade to the population. You go to Cuba, and they don't talk about embargo. They call, they call it a blockade, because they want to make the impression that you actually have warships, US warships preventing Cuba from trading to any other country in the world where you can buy a Coke from made in Mexico, for example, in, in Havana. But they want to give this impression to the local populace, population. You know, they want to say like, well, the dilapidated state of the economy, the sorry state of the economy, uh, the impoverishment that the Cubans have undergone for 40 years is the fall of the US, is the fall of the blockade, and it's not the fall of socialist policies. And that's one of the reasons why the, the, the embargo and the travel ban were counterproductive, or are counterproductive, because they give this excuse to a regime to present itself as a victim also internationally. Every single summit of Latin American presidents, you have the number one topic, or the, in the top five topics, you know, in the declaration and by the end of the summit is calling for an end of the embargo. Call, it's not about human rights in Cuba. It's not about democracy. It, it's. Uh, it's about, it's about the, the embargo. So I think that by engaging Cuba, the president is actually calling the bluff of the regime. You know, we're going to now trade with you. We're going to, hopefully, I mean, if Congress were to lift the, the remaining sanctions, we're going to allow Americans to travel freely to Cuba. But now, your excuse is over. Now, the focus will be on the lack of freedoms and the lack of democracy in the island. And we're starting to see that. You know, we're starting to see that. Now, people are realizing that all the excitement about Cuba that we have seen in the last 18 months has to do more with what the U.S. is doing about Cuba than what Cuba is doing about itself. And you're right. I mean, now you see that, for example, now that uh, Cuban Americans can send more remittances to the island, you see the regime, the regime imposing limits on the amount of money that uh, Cubans can send to the island. Now that people, you know, uh, Cuban Americans can bring, you know, TVs, can bring rep uh, repairmen uh, parts, they can bring a lot of stuff to help their families in Cuba to start a business. Now you see the regime imposing restrictions on the, on the amount of goods that Cuban Americans can bring to the island. So I think that's exposing the nature of the regime. It was all like an excuse. The whole victimhood uh, thing that we are, we are under the repression of the US government because of the embargo. Once the embargo is gone, they will have to look for something else. What about my point about using a movement to get rid of Castro? Forget about engaging that. And as far as what you just said about Obama, come on now. But Obama does not want to engage Cuba to make, make it democratic. He is engaging Cuba out of a guilt, out of a, a uh, the United States is to blame for this embargo when we've imposed ourselves 
on, on Cuba. That's the whole mindset. Now, come on, you know, we're at, we're at CPAC. We're not, we're not at yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I don't, I don't think there's any validity to that. Well, I, I think, I think, Unfortunately, just like I mentioned beforehand, how people, you know, they talk about the embargo, but they don't understand, for example, what I mentioned about these, these entities owned by the military and security services, it goes the same to what you're bringing. And it's in regards to, you know, these confiscated properties and these properties that were stolen here from America. Here's what the Obama administration wants to do and those that want us to lift sanctions towards Cuba do. Essentially, they want, essentially, you know, they, they want you to essentially acquiesce to that, the fact that I'm going to steal your car, I've stolen it, and now I'm going to rent it back to you. And you're going to like it. That's essentially what that would entail. And I think that that's frankly immoral. But I don't want to confuse something because we tend to then sometimes confuse something. You know, remittances and sending consumer goods to families is not the same as the embargo and what's at the heart of transacting business with Cuba. Those are two different things. There's humanitarian and there's commercial. We can have a reasonable argument, I believe, in regards to the humanitarian uh, perspective. I think that the arguments for the commercial part are, are much more uh, circumspect in that regards because what that entails, I always hear this excuse thing. Let's take away the excuse from Castro. Let's take away the excuse from Castro. But that entails something very fundamental, a fundamental assumption that the Cuban people are stupid. Because who the hell believes that? IRI, the International Republican Institute, has been for the last 10 years doing internal polls in Cuba for over a decade. And all of them, just look at the number of people that tell you the reason for our ills are the embargo. It's minimal. It's always been less than 10%. Cubans aren't dying on the Florida Strait. There aren't over 100,000 Cubans buried on the Florida Straits because they think that we're the cause of all of their ills. Cubans know what the cause of all of their ills are. They want to be, um, they love Americans. They're telling you when they go down there and things of the sort. You know, so I believe my, my concern with that is if we take that away, you know, we're, we, we're essentially taking away their only hope. You know, people say, oh, the reason why Cubans are, are doubling their, their immigration rate right now is because of the, their fear of the Cuban Adjustment Act going. Hey, the Cuban Adjustment Act, there was no fear of that in 1980 when the Morel boat lift. There was no fear of that in 1994 during the rafters uh, crisis. You know, the reason Cubans are leaving is, look, there's a psychological thing this, to, to this. And I know the media portrays it has this whole view, but think of it in the psyche of Cubans. If the president of the United States goes and says, hey, this regime, we're going to normalize relations, and essentially they're here to stay. That has a bad psychological impact. I'm getting the hell out while I can because this is not going to change, which goes to the fundamental question, which I, I thought it was kind of silly the way the freshman was questioned. What's going to happen when Castro dies? Et That's the whole point of this. The whole point of our sanctions, oh, has sanctions worked, et cetera, or not? I'll tell you this. Cuba's, the Cuba's regime is politically, socially, and economically bankrupt. So now we have a choice. You can take that funnel, and we can allow the Castro regime to decide who's going to control each key a a aspect of that, or we could essentially have forced other players into and giving them the position. I don't want to monopolize that, so I'm going to shut up now. But I think that's the fundamental question here. And unfortunately, we're giving all of the levers to Raul Castro to say, hey, my son-in-law, General Luis Alberto Rodriguez Lopez Calleja, you're going to run the entire economy. My son, Alejandro Castro, Colonel Alejandro Castro, you're going to run the entire security apparatus. And my daughter, you know, uh, Mariela, she's the cute one, and she speaks nice. She's going to be the PR person. And guess what? We've just handed it over to a new generation of Castros, courtesy of Obama. Young lady. That's, that, that's a good question because he's talking about meeting with civil society, which doesn't necessarily mean, which doesn't necessarily mean dissidents, you know, and probably it's the Cuban government, the one that is going to decide who's going to be there and who's not. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this, is, this has been pointed out by, by several people who support President Obama on, on his engagement to Cuba, Andres Oppenheimer, for example, being one, that he says that this is a bad idea. Uh, and that uh, he's actually allowing the Castros to get, to get away with it. Yeah, I wanted to, to just mention briefly something about uh, what you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, like the, the whole amount of uh, remittances that Cuban Americans can send to the island and, and the goods they can bring to the island certainly was not part of, 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 of the embargo per se, but those restrictions were toughened during, the president, during president Bush and President Obama relaxed them. And isn't it interesting, isn't it interesting that every time a Democratic president came to the White House, uh, and try to engage Cuba. Cuba always looked for an excuse to tense the relationship. Jimmy Carter came to power, 
you had the Marielitos, uh, uh, the Mariel uh, uh, mass immigration. President Clinton came to, uh, to power, then you have that plane being shot down in the Strait of, of Florida. President Obama came to power, Ariel uh, 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 Grossman was arrested uh, and, and made it difficult. So every time that you, that you had a president who sent signals to the Cubans that the United States was willing to engage Cuba, you saw that it was the regime that didn't want to engage the United States. And we're seeing it now. In this engagement between the United States and, and Cuba, Cuba has always been the reluctant partner. Cuba has always been the one dragging his feet because the excuse, their excuse is gonna be over. Uh, they, they need the scapegoat of the United States and they need the uh, boogeyman of the United States to present themselves as victims. And the fact that now President Obama is calling the bluff of the Castro regime is making it difficult for them to keep uh, pounding on supposedly being victims of US aggression. This is the most important issue. This is the most, we've hit upon the most important issue here. And it's one, with all due respect to my friend Juan Carlos, that's one based on a certain intellectual elitism from abroad. The issue here is not about the United States and Cuba. And people like to say, oh, when there's a democratic president, there's always some, something happens because don't, you underestimate whether we think that we're gonna take away the excuse because the Cuban people are stupid and all of a sudden they're gonna realize, hey, Americans are great and you know, look, this is, this is suck because of Castro, not because of the Americans. In the same way with this whole notion of that Mariel, that the rafters crisis, that the shoot down had to do with the United States. Let me tell you what it had to do with. It had to do with opposition from the Cuban people. The Mariel boat lift in 1980 began after Cubans crashed a bus through the, through the Peruvian embassy in Havana and before you knew it, 10,000 Cubans were holed up in a small small compound in Cuba, and all of a sudden Castro said, what the hell am I going to do? Well, guess what? We're going to open the floodgates. In 1994, August 1st, 1990, August 5th, 1994, there was something called the Maleconazo, where you had hundreds of thousands of Cubans that poured into the streets of Havana screaming freedom and, 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 and massive riots and things of the sort. And guess what Castro had to do? Hey, let's get the hell out of here. Let's do this. On February 24th, 1996, you had something called the Concilio Cubano, which were thousands of Cuban dissidents, democracy leaders, were getting together for the first time in history. It was going to be a gathering of over a thousand individuals, leaders in these groups, and get together. The international community was finally had their eyes on it, et cetera. So well, guess what Castro did? He said, you know what? We're going to shoot down these planes and take away international attention. And guess what? We're going to crack down on Concilio Cubano, and we're going to get rid of them. The arrest, the Black Spring of 2003, what was the point of that? Was, was the massive arrest of Cuban dissidents in the Black Spring? Was it because Bush was going to improve relations? No, it was as a result of the Proyecto Arela, which had 25,000 Cuban signatures. The reactions that the Castro regime has abroad are as a result of domestic political pressure. Now, what is a difference between Democratic and Republican presidents is how Castro manifests that. When there's Democratic presidents, they know they can screw the United States over. So guess what? We're going to unleash the floodgates. When it happened under Bush, what did they do? They had to suck it up because Bush told them that if they unleashed a, a, a crisis of that sort, there would be uh, a consequences. They had to suck it up and they had to put them in jail and keep them there and take the international scrutiny, which they thought they could handle because all eyes were on Iraq at the time. Do not underestimate. We have this bad habit of underestimating the intensity, the her heroism of the Cuban democracy movement. And the problem with Obama's policy now, as said by President Obama, and going to answer your question on the trip, was th the fundamental issue, when, and when President Obama wanted to be elected, he went down to Miami in 2008, and he said, the North Star of my policy towards Cuba is the word libertad. If you read Ben Rhodes' piece last week, before he went down to Cuba, Ben Rhodes being the, the wonder child of Obama's foreign policy on both Cuba, Iran, and everything else, he said the North Star of my foreign policy, of my policy towards Cuba now, of Obama's policy towards Cuba, is to improve the lives of the Cuban people. So we've relegated freedom, we've relegated democracy to improve the lives of the Cuban people and whatever the hell that means, because that's subjective and they can define that in any way they can. And what's gonna happen with the dissidents? Are they gonna meet with dissidents? Are they not? They're not, because what Obama did is already, they've already played the Obama administration. December, the president gets down and says in an interview, says, hey, I'm not going to Cuba unless human rights tangibly have improved. Well, guess what? He's now going to Cuba. So what did Castro say the next day? Hey, look, there's no human rights issues in Cuba, and Obama's proved it because he's coming down anyway. Huge mistake. But more importantly, who's he going to meet with? They have all the levers. Why? Because very simply, the other thing Obama said is that the reason we're going down here is essentially to make our policy irreversible. 
And essentially, they want to say irreversible because they're afraid of, I see you're a Ted Cruz guy because of Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio may, may becoming president of the United States and things of the sort. So they need to solidify this, this, uh, this, uh, the, the, the policy. Well, guess what they just did? They just channeled, like they did with the Iran deal, they channeled the ends. So guess what Castro says? Hey, you want to have a commercial deal? You want to do business deals, et cetera? If you speak up, no deals for you. So I'm going to screw your policy over. We've given them all the leverage. Sorry. We've given them all the leverage, you know, handed over to them. I'm sorry, folks, we, it's 7 o'clock. We're going to take one last question. Thank you. I want to know your opinion on uh, the, the plan C for financing socialism of the 21st century. When the Soviet Union came down, Hugo Chavez became the wonder child because of oil money. And now we're seeing that Colombia is signing peace agreements with the FARC, uh, which is the, 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 drug cart the biggest drug cartel in the world, in Havana, Cuba. So while they are like signing peace with the United States, already the Cuban regime is making the plan C on how they're going to finance socialism of the 21st century, which is like invading the rest of Latin America. Because with, I agree with Juan Carlos, in all Latin America, Cuba is admired. Because every person that admires communism is because they don't live in communism. And when you try to say something about human rights, they say, no, education and healthcare are free. So my question is, what possibilities are there that socialism of the 21st century start financing themselves with drugs? And would you think that then the only chance that America has to uh, like stop that is legalizing them? Like, well, that's not really my issue, but you go, go first, I'll follow you. Well, I'm all about, dr I'm all about drug legalization. Uh, well, but I don't know. I mean, like, probably you know better. Well, I mean, like, the Cuban regime has a long history about, uh, with drug dealing, uh, particularly in the 90s when the, the Caribbean route was the main route to bring drug, uh, cocaine into the U.S. via uh, Miami. Uh, I don't know right now. I mean, uh, certainly the, the cocaine business is not going to disappear once the FARC supposedly demobilized, which I don't think is going to happen. Uh, but I don't think that drug is going to be, I mean, like the Korean government needs more and more money than just like a cocaine business. You know, they, they're in great need of, of another patron uh, to sustain themselves. I just wanted to uh, fi finish uh, saying a, a couple of things, you know, about, about my position, why I support this. Well, again, uh, it, it didn't work. I mean, we're not talking about here about theories. We're not talking about possibilities. We know for a fact that the, the embargo and the travel ban didn't work. It didn't work in 50 years, and it wasn't going to work in the next five years, and it wasn't going to work in the next uh, 10 years. So that's the whole point about this debate. What we're talking about here about two possibilities that we haven't explored, no. We're talking about one possibility that did we did explore, and it utterly failed. And I agree with you that Cubans are not stupid. And Last year, there was a, a poll taken by the Washington Post and Univision uh, uh, in, in Cuba, and it shows that a majority of Cubans in the island favor uh, reapproachment with the United States. So I think that we should listen. We should listen to the voices of the Cuban, of the Cuban people in the island. You, we should listen to the voices of leading dissidents in the island, like Joanny Sanchez, who claim that the embargo is actually counterproductive and makes their case more difficult. Freedom is subversive, and you don't foster freedom by curtailing the freedom of Americans to travel and, and, and to trade, and you don't foster freedom by curtailing the, the freedoms of Cubans to uh, engage with Americans and trade with them. That will be it. So first of all, let me, in regards to that poll, the poll was, was Washington Post and Univision put it out, but it was actually done by, by, a, by a company by called uh, Ben Dixon and Amandi, and it was asked by the Obama administration to do this poll. And these are, and it's a Democratic poll, so that was done. And this is the same pollster, a pollster who has never polled in Cuba before, has no idea how to poll in Cuba. And funny, because the Obama administration never cared about the IRI polls done by professionals that have been polling closed societies for decades, but all of a sudden they send in these guys that never, but they did poll in Nicaragua in 1991, and these are the same pollsters that said uh, that Daniel Ortega would beat Chamorro by 15 points, and he actually ended up losing by 12 points. Um, so, so in this regards, you know, that, that, that does not have a, a very good track record in that sense. But look, I think he's made, Juan Carlos makes a very fundamental point, which is what you see in the media played out all the time. So, you know, you know change is a verb, change can also be a noun, but change is not a policy. And essentially to say, hey, look, you know, 
we've had this policy, it hasn't worked, and et cetera. First of all, you have to define what hasn't worked is. You know, look, we, we have money laundering laws and there's still money laundering. Let's get rid of the money laundering laws. And we have, you know, we have uh, criminal organizations and, you know, let's get rid of the RICO laws because there's still criminal organizations. These entities owned by the Cuban Military and Intelligence Services are criminal organizations. And what we have are laws. Look, I wish I was a complete libertarian and I love the Cato Institute and that the market fixed everything, but even God doesn't believe that because he gave us the Ten Commandments. So we need to have a certain uh, legal perspective, and it's about common sense. Do we want to do unconditional business with these criminal organizations owned by the Cuban military and, and intelligence services? No. As regards tourism, it's about travel-related transactions. Why, why does Castro want tourism more than anything? Because this is the number one source of revenue. Tourism is to Cuba. Like people say, oh, but we can travel to Iran and North Korea, but not Cuba. Tourism is, not, tourism is to Cuba what oil is to Iran. We would sanction oil, like if we sanction oil for Cuba and tourism to Iran, well then we'd be really stupid, then we'd be really short-sighted. But look, the fundamental issue is this, and, and, and I'm gonna end with President Obama's trip because it goes to the whole geopolitical perspective, which I think is very important and I think goes to your question as well. People say, oh, it's the first time Obama went down since Calvin Coolidge. Um, yes, but it's also the first time, and I think this is very important, it's the first time that, that a US president goes to a dictatorship since Lyndon Johnson went to see Somoza and toast with him in 1968 in Nicaragua. That's not something we should be doing nowadays. 34 out of 35 countries in Latin America today are democracies, some more imperfect than others, and we're seeing the issues in Venezuela thanks to uh, Cuba's continued agitation, uh, but we're seeing all of those issues. I think the model that should be followed is that of President Reagan. And President Reagan, he went in 1982, he went to Honduras to celebrate the election of Dr. Roberto Cordova eh, Suazo, who was the first constitutional elected president of Honduras after decades of military rule. And he went, and that began a process of saying our priority, our North Star of our policy is democratization, and that began and unleashed that tidal wave. Because we stand for something. And frankly, I don't care if other countries don't like our policy. But we should not lower our standards because other countries don't like our standards and they're unwilling to raise theirs. If 34 out of 35 countries, man, it's funny because the Europeans don't like our Cuba policy. But there's only, like the Americas, where only one country is an anomaly, in Europe, the anomaly is Belarus. And yet I don't see European leaders traveling to Minsk saying, hey, let's unleash tourism and trade and things of the sort with Belarus because that's going to make things all the better. Now, that's also very complicated because you have Russia and you have different things. But the bottom line is it is in the interest of Europe, as it is in the interest of the United States, our priority should be in this hemisphere, democratization. And, and, and when people say, oh, but look, we do China and Vietnam, all that stuff, there's no room for a China and Vietnam model in the Western hemisphere. We've had that before. It was called Somoza, it was called Batista, it was called uh, uh, um, uh, Pinochet. It, it was called, it, we've had that before. There's no room for that. And if we're now gonna say, as Obama himself said, hey, we should have like a China, we can have a China model here. We're opening up the floodgates. And by the way, state capitalism, which now seems like a pretty cute common thing, you know, had a name, you know, 50 years ago. It was called fascism and it sucks, you know? <laughs> and we should not allow it here in the Western hemisphere. It is against our geopolitical interests and I'll close with that. Thank you very much. And Juan Carlos, thank you. Mauricio, thank you for a, a serious uh, discussion of the issue. Uh, very well presented, the particular viewpoints. And I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, enjoy the rest of your CPAC, folks. Thanks.